Christ Church, it's great to be with you. Um, we are here at your off, diocesan office um, with our bishop, and um, uh, this was our fifth and final Lenten series. Um, and so we're we're thankful that we can get this recorded before we have the stay at home and work safe um, uh, resolution from the mayor. So we're recording this before that happens. Um, so we're not violating any rules. So we just want you to know that. So um, we hope you're safe. We hope you're doing well. And um, the bishop and I are gonna have a, a conversation today about um, his ministry and what he loves about the Episcopal Church and, um, and anywhere else that the conversation goes. And we hope that that will be great for you to, um, to hear that. So before we begin, um, I'd like to open us in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for the gift of our church. Um, no matter where it is or how it functions um, in this um, precarious time, Lord God, the church is still the church and we're thankful for that because the church is the people. Well, even if our buildings are closed and our offices are, are not functioning in the same way, we're still the church. Um, and I give thanks to God for, for that. And Lord God, we pray that you would keep all of our people safe that you would um, sustain us, you would heal us and restore us physically, emotionally, spiritually, um, and that you would be our light and our rock um, in this time. And Lord God, we give you thanks for our bishop and for his ministry among us and with us and for us um, and all that he does and his leadership. And Lord God, we pray that you would sustain him um, and his staff, um, our diocesan staff, and that you would keep them safe um, and that you would give them courage and wisdom um, in the days and weeks ahead. And so, Lord God, we lift this time up to you and we pray that um, our conversation would be uh, your conversation and that our words would be the words that you would want our people to hear at this time. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Well, Bishop, thank you for taking time out of your schedule to do this. Um, we wish we could have you at uh, Christ Church in our parish hall in front of, um, you know, we've been averaging, um, well, we had one, so our average was the one that we had. Of, good. Yeah, of 70 um, or so people. Um, but I think our audience might be a little wider because of this as well, of how we're doing this today. Um, you know, our theme has been the intersection of the sacred and the secular. Um, and the questions that I sent you were basically, you know, why the Episcopal Church and why um, the Episcopal Church has been a place that you've been a part of and a church that you've been a part of for your entire life. And so I'm just going to start by saying, where were you born? How did it all begin? You know, where, where's your hometown? What did church life look like as a boy? Hmm. <laughs> well, I can talk a long time. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. But first, let me just echo what you said and that's a, that I wish that we were able to do this in person and that I could be in the beautiful space at Christ Church eating the delicious non-Lenten like food that y'all <laughs> serve at your Lenten suppers and enjoying the fellowship and I was very happy that I could be present for the first one. Uh, always uh, thankful for the people and clergy at Christ Church and, and I, I wish we could be together in person and like all of you we're doing the best we can given the circumstances we have um the the when justin sent me the um my topic which was to have been given live on april fool's day let me just point that <laughs> out thanks very much yes um why the episcopal church and and i was joking that my answer is simply why not um but but he's opened up and broadened that for me, uh, asked me to be more personal in talking about it. So I, I, unfortunately, I'll save some of my theological lectures on on um, the incarnation and um, <laughs> redemption and uh, participation in God for another time. But but um, I, I mentioned to him this morning that my hometown is now under the same kind of order that uh, San Antonio and Bear County are under. And uh, that hometown is Brownsville down at the border in Cameron mm -hmm. County. Um, I have um, five brothers and sisters and four of them live there with their families. Um, 
I was born and raised there. Uh, my The third of six children, so my younger sister and I argue over who the perfect middle child is. I think it was <laughs> me, she thinks it's her. Um, but um, when, I, when I think about that question, why, why the Episcopal Church, the first, really what I thought of was having read some, an interview way back of a, some prominent theologian, German theologian, who nobody would ever remember because prominent German theologians are pretty obscure. <laughs> but at any rate, he was interviewed and asked, why are you a Christian? And, and um, the interviewer thought it would be some profound Germanic theological response. And, and he said, I'm a Christian because of my grandmother. Hmm. And so I think theology for all of us carries with it autobiography. And so I'm really grateful to you, Justin, for inviting me to to go that way rather than to, to give sort of a confirmation class um, uh, lecture on some aspect of yeah. the Episcopal yeah. Church. So, so um, I'm an Episcopalian because of my parents. Um, my Mother Olive was uh, raised Southern Baptist. She was a very good Southern Baptist. Um, mm -hmm. My father, uh, Bill, was raised in the Roman Catholic Church, and I think he was a good Catholic boy, at least till he went off into the army in World War II. Um, but when he and my mother met and fell in love and got married, neither was going to become what the other was, and their best friends were Episcopalian and they invited them to come to church, and so that's why I'm an Episcopalian. Yeah. But not just because I was baptized as an infant in the marble font at Advent. Uh, Advent was founded in 1851. It's wow. older than the Diocese of West Texas. Um, it, it, it's a beautiful building. Um, but I, I'm an Episcopalian not because I was baptized there, but because I was raised there. I was raised um, in a church-going family, informed by that. And like, like many of the things and people that we love, we love, and then we figure out the reasons why we love so much mm -hmm. later. And so, I can't remember when I consciously came to love our church, um, but it's always been part of my life. And and. Um, I do have memories from childhood of, of going to church, and that, that was back in a simpler, more ancient time when it seemed like <laughs> everybody went to church all the time, and there weren't a lot of options on Sunday, and we weren't given a lot of choices about what we wanted to do on Sunday, so we went. And my mother uh, was frequently having babies <laughs> when I was growing up, and and so I can remember my grandfather taking me to church. Mm -hmm. um, he was an Episcopalian. My grandmother remained a, a, a very devout Roman Catholic her entire life, um, including re not eating meat even after the, the bishop or pope said it was okay for older people too. Wow. She held, held the line. <laughs> and, um, but, but we would go, you know, we would go and, and I had one priest almost my entire growing up time from the time I was three till the time after I was ordained at uh, 26. Uh, Rufus Stewart was rector at Church of the Advent and, and I couldn't remember more than a couple of sermons that he preached during my growing up time. My years, is, and of course, that would be from when I was a young adult and most I remember them because he would give the same sermon about the same time of year. And so <laughs> you would remember those things. But but I remember being there and I remember uh, loving the hymns and, and my mother loving to sing and my father having a terrible singing voice, but occasionally singing too. And um, that was where we went. And yeah. that's where friends went. Uh, and all my friends, I think were going somewhere uh, yeah. to church on Sunday. Um, I, Church of the Advent has a, a beautiful old stained glass window uh, above the altar of Jesus the Good Shepherd. Mm. And I think before I could read and really pay much attention that that image 
uh, spoke to me in significant ways that just stayed with me. And yeah. even now when I go into that church, I'm, I'm touched by that window. And it's an old traditional stained glass window, Jesus with sheep following behind and carrying yeah. a lamb. Interestingly, as uh, an ordained person now, um, I've become aware of a newer stained glass window that was put in when I was young, but I, I just remember it being very colorful, and it's Jesus the Lamb of God at the back of the church. So those two images of, of our Lord as the Good Shepherd and as the perfect sacrificial Lamb of God are, are yeah. powerful, powerful pieces. I, not Again, for me, autobiographically, but I think for our church, um, as Jesus is the, the, the one we follow, and he's also the one who, by his love, his perfect self-offering, opens for us the way to follow. Yeah. And, and so that has stayed with me. Um, so I, I went to church, I went to Sunday school. Um, I, I remember enjoying Sunday school. We did all the Sunday school things, I guess, that kids in the 60s we're doing, you know, bean shields and you know, the apostles <laughs> studying the lives of the apostles in a, in a way that for a boy was really engaging because I don't know how much they made up, but but uh, pious legends that that uh, drew young boys who lived in a world of of heroes yeah. and and um, to to hear stories about the apostles and their courage and their faith and appropriate for a child and as you grow older you discover it's a lot more complicated but right, still right. Um, models for us of those who follow Jesus so um, when when I I got confirmed when I was 12 by uh, Earl Dicus who was the suffragan bishop of the diocese at that time and the only thing I remember is that he was really tall so I try to be humble in all that I do with confirmation classes now that <laughs> Chances are they may not remember much of what I do or say, and they certainly won't remember that I was tall. But, yeah. but, um, but I remember that now as an experience of the larger church, and maybe my first experience of the Episcopal Church being more than yeah. just Church of the Advent. Um, I um, we had acolyte festivals in Dawson and acolyte festivals, so in, in junior high, high school, participated in those. That was a time when only boys were acolytes. So there's other, I can tell whole stories about dances at the acolyte festivals where we had to beg every girl we knew to come, but that's another <laughs> time. Um, and, and then when I was 15, uh, a group of my friends and I decided that we wanted to go to Camp Capers mm -hmm. and be counselors. And I, I have no idea how it led to We had a youth group where we resisted all attempts to do religious things. We just wanted to play pool and ping pong and hang out. But our parents were pretty insistent that we need, you know, we needed something for our betterment. So yeah. we would have to do something. <laughs> um, but somehow these guys and I decided we were we wanted to go to camp and learn how to be counselors. And um, in the end, um, I was the only one along with a girl from my church that and we rode up to Camp Capers from Brownsville which then was about a six hour drive I think I didn't know anybody I was um, relatively shy at that time in my life 15 um, I know it's hard to believe now since I won't quit <laughs> talking but but um, it was kind of an unusual thing for me to go and do something like yeah. that yeah. Um, and so um, what, this is what I remember, and this I think is, is a significant part of my life, everything that happened after, and that is, it was a midwinter conference, so a weekend, and it was about counselor training, and, and so didn't know anybody except the, the girl I rode up there with, and um, I remember the Friday night being very painful, or, or un, not pain, uncomfortable didn't know people and I remember standing against the wall like high school guys do at, at dances uh, and and um, this this guy came over and started talking to me and he was a, a count one of the counselors um, 
and he was a senior in high school. So for a sophomore, that's pretty cool that yeah, a senior yeah. came and noticed me and started mm-hmm. talking to me, uh, was interested in me, and he was a football player at whatever high school he went to here in San Antonio. Um, I played football, so we had that in common. And um, before I realized it, I had been peeled from the wall and was uh, mm-hmm. engaged in whatever was going on. And um, ever since then, I wish that I could remember his name so yeah. that I could thank him because if he had not done that, if he had not noticed this awkward teenage boy leaning against a wall, um, I probably would not have gone back. Yeah. And if I hadn't gone back, um, become a counselor, learn to love uh, the life that young people experience at camp, I wouldn't have been there when I was 20 and yeah. heard God calling me to ordain ministry there. So, so, it, so it sounds like invitation has been a big aspect of of your um your journey your your family was invited to church mm-hmm. after your parents were married um then that story just now with the um the senior inviting you to be part of the group mm-hmm. at, at midwinter um and um so how did god invite you or call you into ministry what did that look like well, at the moment, <laughs> it was terrifying. I'll say yeah, that. Exactly. Um, yeah, I agree. So, <laughs> so when, when I was in college, um, and I, I, I'll try to shorten this a little bit, but, but I think some of the background and context matters because it, it, it has convinced me ever since that God is, is at work in ordinary decisions and ordinary yeah. circumstances. Yeah. And it, for me, at least, my my clearest vision is in hindsight as far as when God is working in my life or it's rare in the moment that I am that I can see that but in hindsight it it becomes a lot clearer oh yeah that God was right there Um, so after being a counselor um, you know for a week or two a summer throughout the rest of my high school time and into college um, one of my friends that I had made there at camp from San Antonio, a guy named Gary Lillibridge, um, <laughs> called and, and said, uh, hey, they're going to hire counselors for the whole summer. You should apply. And I'm like, you know, they, they only hire San Antonio people. That was my, my yeah. bias or their prejudice or misconception at the time. But he encouraged me to hire, but I had a Anyway, so I applied and and I got it, and it was this incredible summer um, in my not. It was just it was fun. I mean, it was complete. It wasn't completely fun. What is? But it was yeah. incredibly fun and in hard work, and and also a summer of self discovery. I learned I was good at some things that I never really thought I'd be good at, or never even thought about. Um, I was a pretty good counselor. I, I was good with with uh, children and, and teenagers, um, and um, and also it was a time of deepening my faith. And it was a time. It was the first time really that that I was still I was beginning to know clergy as normal people, as normal as clergy are. But <laughs> that that it was the you know I loved my rector, but he was not somebody that I. You know, he was a lot older than me, and all of a sudden I was with uh, younger and, and to me, very cool clergy, and um, I could talk to them about serious things and things that concern me and, and have fun, and so that was a shift in my understanding. Um, but then the, the, the next summer, um, I, was, I had a, an internship lined up as a summer job with a newspaper. I was a journalism major. And um, in the spring, they uh, was notified that they were not gonna have the internship. They canceled the position. And mm. and so um, anyway, Gary, again, uh, uh, you know, he encouraged me to apply. So I did. And in that summer, it was at, at senior high camp. Uh, we were in the chapel late at night. Um, mm. One of Christ's church clergy was the dean. It was uh, Melvin Gray, 
and he was joined by two other young cool clergy as the the, the teacher was a priest named Jeff Kramer who I think was at St. Luke's and Mike Chalk, a beloved mm -hmm. um, rector emeritus at St. Mark's was the chaplain anyway. I, but I couldn't tell you who was talking, who was leading chapel that night. It was just late at night and we're sitting in chapel. And um, I, I was weighed down by many things as a lot of 20, 21 year olds are about my life and my future and a lot of self preoccupation. And, and all of a sudden it was like everything just cleared away all that worry all that way just there was this clear space and i heard god say um, i want you to be a minister mm -hmm. and um that was it yeah and the it, rest is history <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah not immediately so i did not jump up and say hallelujah yeah I'm here fact, take me. Yeah, right? yeah, here I am. I'm glad you finally <laughs> spotted me. Yeah. I was terrified. Yeah. I did not want to do it. I I was much more like Jonah than like Samuel. Um and um I'd taken enough psychology at UT to try to psychologize the whole experience right. and <laughs> spent a number of months um trying to find a way out of it yeah and only after quite a few months did did it become something that I thought might be true and that I might pursue yeah. that I might respond yes to and then the rest becomes yeah. history and so um, so if we were to fast forward um, uh, you're now the bishop of the diocese of mm -hmm. West Texas um, you get to travel around and, and go to um, every church in our diocese. You get to see the stained glass windows mm -hmm. in every place. You get to um, be with the clergy that have molded and shaped you in your spiritual life, mm -hmm. and now you get to give that back to some degree. Um, uh, for you know, you've done that for me. You do that for countless clergy and people. Um, so. What's what's the greatest joy in in your work as in your hmm. in your ministry as the bishop in getting to do um, what you do with the diocese that you love? I it just it's hard. It would be hard to name one thing. <laughs> yeah. um, and thanks for not asking. What do I really <laughs> dislike about this? Yeah, well, yeah. that's a different list, obviously. <laughs> that's right, but. but um, the Sunday mornings in the churches are almost always times of, of joy yeah. and encouragement. And it took me a, a, at least a year, maybe two years, to get used to being in a different place every Sunday. Uh, I, I'm the kind of person that I love parish ministry. I love being in the same place week after week mm -hmm. and year after year. and. That was one of the hardest things for me to give up was because I love parish ministry yeah. and, and I do believe it's where uh, the gospel uh, meets life yeah. and, and lives are transformed. But but, it, but being with people now uh, on Sundays, uh, having been around enough, around the diocese enough to, to feel more at home uh, almost everywhere, to have not be so preoccupied with what I'm doing next that I can't um, pay attention. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I notice uh, the stained glass windows. I notice the beauty of the liturgy in that place. I feel like I participate in yeah. it and not just am leading it. Um, that That's one of the greatest joys. It's also one of the hard things because being away from home so often is tough. And um, every bishop that I have served for um, would say the same thing uh, yeah. that uh, Sunday mornings are, are where we feel most like we're engaged in the apostolic ministry that we're called to um, of being with the people uh, yeah. proclaiming the gospel celebrating the sacraments of, of encouraging the church in its local setting encouraging the church to be the church where it is that, that's a as a source of great joy yeah. and, and it's also it's humbling because to be called to that and to be privileged to participate in it is just 
a, a, a wonder to me that and I get I, to do this. In light of what you just said, I can I can only imagine the 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 sorrow, if you will, um, of of having to write to your diocese to um, not just request, but to to command or demand that we stop worship mm -hmm. because of the coronavirus. Yeah. Um, in light of that being your your greatest joy, and and I would agree, that's my greatest joy too. The Sunday morning mm -hmm. um, worship experience, or or any type of worship experience mm -hmm. where we gather as a community celebrate the sacraments, sing together, pray together, confess mm -hmm. together, be absolved together. Um, um, so share with us, um, you know, in light of where we are today and where we're gonna be tomorrow, at least in Bear County and mm -hmm. San Antonio and, and Brownsville and, and most likely other uh, cities around mm -hmm. our diocese. Um, uh, and church has changed, um, you know, the where we worship has changed but who we are hasn't changed to some degree so um what are some thoughts on on that i'm sure you have many but I, I share have, a few yeah, I'll, with I'll us to, yeah. i'm trying to limit myself and yeah you feel free to turn it off <laughs> but I, I think on the one hand i i try to remind myself that every time we gather for worship for the eucharist at least that we're reminded as we pray our prayers that that we are gathered not just with the however many people are in that space at that time but that that we proclaim that we're gathered with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven so so there is a reality um, that's deeper and and broader and truer than than the, the, the the seen and experienced reality of any given moment. That that as he, the writer of the Hebrews puts it, there we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Right. And so, um, so I I need to keep saying that not just to to you and to all the churches, but to me, because I have a fear that this is going to end up feeling really lonely. Yeah, and and people will feel isolated, and I I think that, you know, some of the things that we're doing now, um, that to keep it interesting and lively in two weeks, we're gonna be, we're gonna be really wanting to be out, <laughs> right? And yeah. those things that are exciting and new that we're doing, some of them are gonna, gonna really become annoying. Yeah. Uh, I was telling the staff this morning that I, I noticed that kind of normal disruptions and annoyances have taken on this power and so that added to the the constant disruption uh, you know I find myself on edge over more normal things that yeah. are just part of everyday life anyway so so one of the things is that, that I think it's important is for people of faith to remember that there's always more to this life uh, more than just the present circumstances yeah that, that we we have been given a living hope that, that is uh, rooted in resurrection and and that um, the present circumstances as trying as they are and and as challenging as they are and the very real danger of the the pandemic um, that this is not the last thing um, and and so for people to encourage people as much as possible, and I, I see lots of evidence of this around the diocese, yeah. of the way that churches are trying to hang together and hold together and be reminded of the unity we share in Christ that, that, is, that transcends time and space. Um, I mean, Jesus is not limited uh, in ways that we're limited right now. And so we count on uh, on his presence and and his his ability as the Son of God to bind us together, and that the Spirit continues to work, and that that this present difficulty will pass. Yeah. And there are people still living who can remember more difficult times than <laughs> this, and we're okay. Um, none of us have been in this circumstance before, but others have. Um, and one of the things I love about our church 
is that we're not left to our own devices. We don't have to figure everything out on our own. Um, just as on Sunday morning, I'm so thankful I don't have to make up stuff every time I walk into the church, yeah. that, that I have this whole tradition, this living tradition that, that uh, I'm part of. And, yeah. and I like that our people can be confident that they don't have to depend on me to have all the wisdom every Sunday, that, that it, there's this uh, uh, corporate historical wisdom that we have gained by the, the indwelling of the Spirit and the ongoing life of Christ in our midst that, that mm-hmm. we carry with us. And I, I think in this, this difficult time, and it is difficult, and there's a lot of fear, legitimate fear and anxiety, but we don't give in to the fear and we, don't, we try not to operate from fear, but to, to act from the love that we have received and extend that to others. Yeah. Um, wow. so I don't know if I answered your question. No, <laughs> no it's, I told it's, you. it's beautiful. I think um, uh, turning back to, to you all, Christ Church, um, uh, ponder some of the things that the, the bishop has talked about with us today. Uh, I think the biggest is to, to think about, you know, why the Episcopal Church? What drew you here? Who invited you? Hopefully you were invited by somebody that you just didn't find the first Episcopal Church in the phone book and arrive. That We're glad you did that too. Um, but we hope that you are invited by somebody. Um, who are the relationships that you, you, what, that you have, you know, and what do those look like and how have those formed you? Um, uh, the bishop has shared with us a lot of uh, the relationships he has. Um, and then I think the the biggest thing is in this time of of kind of um, of flux, right? We're in transition. Um, we're we're not gathering in our normal worship mode. Um, what are some new routines that that you can build in? Um, prayer book routines. You know, we're doing morning and evening prayer. Um, Sunday mornings, um, doing morning prayer and evening prayer on Wednesdays. That live streams into your home. Um, I would encourage you to look at the prayer book and do morning, noonday, evening prayer every day, um, especially in this time where we're not together, um, building in some of that, that structure that, that I think we are feeling at a loss of because of being away from each other, that maybe we can have some sense of, of structure while we're, we're away. Um, and then I, I would love for you to think about as well, um, in light of the ministry that our bishop has with us, um, and in light of the ministry that your clergy at Christ Church has with you, um, but we're all ministers. Um, and so what is your ministry? Um, and maybe this time of, of um, transition, this time of stay at home and work safe um, can be a time where we can discern um, how God is calling us and wanting to utilize us and the gifts that we have. So ponder those thoughts and ideas um, and um, I hope that when we gather back together in the presence of, of each other and in our great, um, great church, that we would be able to have a renewed spirit of, of how God is the light of the world and how we share that light with others. So thank you for tuning in. We're glad that you are with us. And Bishop, can I indulge you and ask you to, to close us in prayer? I would love to. I, great. Actually, I have a prayer that I Wonderful. have used with our staff the last few weeks. and. It, it's uh, not in our current prayer book. It comes out of the 1928 prayer book. Um, that uh, if you think 1928, 10 years before, was the end of World War II and uh, World War One, and the beginning of this the Spanish flu pandemic, when worldwide many, many, many thousands and thousands of people died, and and so I imagine this prayer being written out of a time. Hmm. Uh, uh, where people were starting to recover and and uh, but with a real concern for what might come. So this is a prayer for in time of an epidemic. So wow. I'll close with this. O most mighty and merciful God, in this time of grievous sickness, we flee unto thee for succor. Deliver us, we beseech thee from our peril. Give strength and skill to all those who minister to the sick. Prosper the means made use of for their cure. And grant that perceiving how frail and uncertain our life is, we may apply our hearts unto that heavenly wisdom which leadeth to eternal life. 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. As I said, I like not having to make things up all the time. And, <laughs> and thank you so much for, for the invitation to be part of the Lenten series. And, and thanks be to God for the, the light that shines in and from Christ Church. Thank you. Thanks for being okay. with us today. Thanks.